in everything we do at school, although you teach a subject independently, within that subject you, you are bombarded by um, chances to explore science, to explore maths, to explore history. No one subject has one answer. I think we've got to be far more open as educators to embrace you know, these divided topics. Science is facts. Religion, they'll say, is opinions. That's pretty much the first thing they say about science. What they really want to know is what is their own experience of being human and how should they understand that. And that question has become wonderfully tangible at the moment because we have these robots and the robots look almost human-like. And in fact, we can get the robots to do things that seem almost human-like. What many of the children say to us when they think about these almost human-like robots, they say, well, now I don't feel so special. And that's because they can sort of see the robot. Instead of thinking about how the robot might climb up to the point where they feel they're at, they start to sort of bring their understanding of themselves down to what they understand about the robot. Are we anything more than that? Or if you really analysed us, we are, are we just a sort of a sum of patterns that you could understand and predict scientifically? So that question, as you know, is a very old question, but it's very real to people at the moment because we are asking those questions about robots. When we did the research, we found how many things are missing in their thinking, gaps in their thinking, because they've never really needed to study what kinds of questions are being explored in each classroom. So they'll say to us things like, oh, well, in science, we do experiments. We get proof. They're very convinced by science. And they haven't really thought about why the questions in the two classrooms are actually very different. I was a science teacher that wanted to have those conversations with the children. Is responding to a sound hearing? Is it enough? But creating the space to make it happen in a schoolroom is incredibly difficult. You've got kids looking at the clock wondering when you're going to get back on task and help them with the exam. You know that at any moment the bell will ring and they'll be off to their next lesson. You don't actually get your history teacher talking to your science teacher. So the best thing to do when you get into your science classroom is to kind of close the door on everything that you thought about when you were in other classrooms or even in your everyday life and just focus on what that science lesson is about. What's missing then from children's education is a chance to encounter those big questions. Our whole school is driven from the point of the well-being of the child. So we do have teachers that bring up from other, so not just religious education, but we will have a few science teachers, a few history teachers, a few geography teachers who bring up these big questions. Science is like all around us, it's not mostly about experiments or whatever you do in school, it's more what you do in life about it. Most children think science does help us with why questions. Why do things fall to the ground? Why does orange juice taste disgusting after you've done your teeth? You know, all those sorts of questions are why questions. And science does seem to be able to help us to get answers. So I think it's quite useful to look at the methods that are used in science and to kind of start by trying out what would it be like if we really did apply those methods, those stringent tests, to these big questions. I think mystery is something that's lacking from a lot of uh, classroom teaching. We're too quick to give the answer and expect the children to remember the answer. Uh, whereas mystery, mystery sort of cries out, there must be more here. Children are very good at trying to give parents and grown-ups and teachers in general the answer to the question and the question that they think they want. Every single child I've interviewed has told me that they think about big questions. I think the children were already asking the big questions. Because if you can be uh, We're just bottling it up and stopping them. Teachers are still too afraid to ask the big questions. Um, I think a lot of that is Maybe some people don't feel it's relevant. 
they don't understand the link between getting children to think uh, metacognitively um, and philosophically um, and how that will impact on the learning in their lessons. Some teachers do recognise it, but I think there needs to be a movement towards more explicit metacognition and philosophy for children. Outstanding teachers understand that not ticking that box gives more value to that child's education than anything else. So it's raising the game for a lot of teachers to be thinkers themselves. Science is about observing things. And not only that, but in science we collectively observe. So we look at natural phenomenon, we look at something we can all see, and we collectively observe it and we try and explain what we can see on the basis of more observations. And if we write it up, other people ought to be able to see the same thing. They should see that natural phenomenon, they should see what we observe, they should be able to make sense of it the same way. When you think about the sorts of questions that you're asking in religion, they're really not often those sorts of questions. In fact, they might be a little bit more sometimes like history questions where we're relying on testimony, what people said they experienced. I love a lesson where I can actually introduce a topic and then encourage them to work in pairs or groups and they're actually feeding off each other. I have to do very little but stand back and watch them explore and sort of learn and educate themselves and it's far more powerful. They will then you know, engage um, and take that knowledge further than me standing in front of the classroom for, for half an hour telling them what to do. It saddens me that so many people I meet have lost that spirit of curiosity either through their upbringing or their education. Uh, so many, particularly in schools, so many kids have the motto, don't know, don't care. As a learner, you get comfortable with there doesn't need to be an end result. It needs to be about your personal growth rather than the output that you give. The pinnacle of education is an exam. You go through the whole of your life in school and then you're tested on what you know and giving the right answer. And that's sad. I think questions lead to more answers. And if you have the ability to question, you have the ability to at least start to get answers. Newton, as we know, was inspired and motivated by his faith and far from the only scientist to be inspired by faith. So if we cut out experience with those big questions, we're stopping children who would be motivated by them from looking into science from that perspective, and I think that's a shame. And if you can allow children to feel comfortable to fail, and take that risk, they've got more chance of achieving a higher grade than being mediocre. As someone who's taught several subjects, but mainly history and religious studies, you want the children to be resilient to not come to an answer. There doesn't need to be an answer. And a lot of people and a lot of children are afraid of that. So what's typical in a classroom is if you ask a question, um, children will only put their hand up if they think they have got the right answer for you as a teacher. The really interesting things happen when those subjects are mashed up. When you link biology with physics, when you link music with history, when you take these two subjects and the overlap or even the gaps between them, that for me, that's where the interesting new areas of research lie is the interface between subjects. I think the fantastic contribution that our project has been able to make is to highlight what is missing. It should be objective and observable. We should all be able to see. I'd like to consider myself a teacher that could pull elements in one lesson of the curriculum from other parts um, and try and help the students see the connection. So we are encouraged as teachers in the school to bring up cross-curricular subjects and actually explicitly talk about it to the children in terms of metacognition. But it does take a very special kind of teacher to do that, one who's not afraid to fail themselves. We have a real problem in science at the moment. 
where we're recruiting into science and into engineering a very narrow group of children. We're losing a lot of good scientists and good engineers because we're not showing them how what they're meeting in science and could be meeting in engineering fits into those bigger questions and those wider ways of thinking. We want children to have life skills, uh, be lifelong learners, uh, have those thinking skills that allow them to problem solve. If you teach your children to meet the criteria, you will get mediocre results. But if you teach the children to go outside of that criteria and think for themselves and be brave, you've got more chance of them attaining a higher mark, which, again, you're still teaching for a reason, but actually it's that if you can give the child the resilience and the bravery, then they've got more chance of, of getting there. The first stage is to help teachers and educators, policy makers, to appreciate those gaps, so to see what is missing by not having a multidisciplinary approach. Because our experience has been that once you demonstrate what is missing, and then you show what the children can gain by putting it back in, that those teachers, those policy makers, they want to come on board and they want it to happen too. Science informs our thinking about every part of our lives but your science is not going to get you all the way to an answer on those big questions.